Good morning, my Fräulein and heirs and all the other German stuff. Yes, we are back on to Germany under Hitler, episode 7, The Cultural Wars. Now, I know it's been a while, so I just want to catch you up. Last time, we talked about the great hyperinflation of 1923. We looked at the reasons it happened and how badly it hurt Germany. And we looked at how its height, money didn't mean anything, how people were... Forced, forced to live paycheck to paycheck, no money coming in between. And what money there was often coming from back pay to make up for the rampant inflation, as well as how stores often change their prices hour to hour, even minute to minute. I introduce you to Victor Klemper. And we're going to continue your story off and on through the rest of this podcast series. <coughs> so stay tuned. I talked about how Germany managed to get out from the hyperinflation, how the hyperinflation hurt not only the middle class, but the industrial giants of Germany, who were still blamed for causing the inflation. Now, Weimar was not only split by conflicts that are political or economic. The fights were not simply fought out in parliaments and elections. They permeated every aspect of life. You cannot say that... Germans in the years before the Third Reich didn't care about politics. People actually had way too much political engagement and political commitment in their lives. We can know this simply by looking at the extremely high turnout rate for elections, at least 80% in most contests. Now, during elections in Germany, every spare inch of walls would be covered posters. Every window would be hung with banners. Every building would have the colors of some political party hanging from it. This went far beyond the sense of duty that was said to have driven voters to the polls in the years before the Great War. There was not any area of society or politics that was immune from pol politics. Now that's not more obvious than in the press. No fewer than 4,700 newspapers appeared in Germany in the year 1932, for instance, and 70% 70, 70 of them were published every single day. Now, many of these newspapers, it must be made with local newspapers, small circulation, but there were a few, like the liberal Frankfurt newspaper, that were major broad streets with an international reputation. Now, these types of newspapers, they make up about a small percentage of the politically oriented press, which made about 25% of newspapers. Nearly three-fourths of all the politically oriented newspapers owed their leans to the Central Party, the very very People's Party, or the Social Democrats. The political party set great store by the daily newspapers. For instance, Social Democrats had Fords, and the Communists had the Red Flag, and these were key parts of the respective parties' propaganda apparatus, and headed up an elaborate structure of weekly magazines and local newspapers and glossily illustrated um, periodicals and specialist publications. Now, some newspaper publishers were household names, uh, Willy Monsenberg for the Communists, or Alfred Hugenberg, who had risen to become chairman of the Board of Krupp, then used that money to buy the Sherrill newspaper in 1916, and by 1918 had enough money to buy a major news agency through which he supplied large sections of the press with stories and leading articles during the days of the Weimar Republic. In fact, by the late 1920s, Hugenberg was such a well-known figure that he could buy ownership of the UFA, which was a mammoth film production company. And he used all his media empire to spread the German nationalist ideas across Germany and state that now, now, was a time to store the monarchy. But despite success stories like this, media power did not translate directly into political power. Hugenberg had a huge voice. But he cannot stop the relentless decline of the nationalists after 1924. Musenberg was pretty much out of power after he argued that Joseph Stalin was doing everything wrong in the USSR during the early 1930s. Now, most political newspapers had small circulations. In 1929, Red Flag only sold 28,000 copies a day. Ford's sold 74,000, and The Day, owned by Hugenberg, 70,000. Now, these are drops in the bucket compared to the population in Germany. Overall, the circulation of the overly political press fell by a third between 1925 and 1932. Now, the market 
liberal quality dailies also start, lost circulation with the Frankfurt newspaper slipping from 100,000 copies in 1915 to 71,000 in 1928. These may have been voices shouting for the government, but many of its avid readers voted for non Weimar supporting parties despite buying the newspapers. And one of the main reasons that the political press was being undermined in the 1920s was because a new form of papers were being printed. This is the Boulevard Press. Cheap, sensational tabloids sold out in the streets in the afternoons and evenings, and they did not need daily subscribers to make money. Heavily illustrated. Massive coverage of sport, cinema, local news, crime, scandal, sensation, placed an emphasis on entertainment, not information. Now, yes, they did have a political orientation. Hugenberg had the night edition, which circulation started at 38,000 in 1925 and grown to 202,000 in 1930. Bussenberg had his world in the evening, starting at 12,000 in 1925, rising to 220,000 in 1930. But by and large, the pro Weimar press found it hard to keep up with this con kind of competition. They did try. Sometimes it succeeded, lots, a lot of times it didn't. Now, this is a level where political press had the greatest impact. Scandal sheets undermined the Republic with the sensational exposure of real and false financial wrongdoings of pro Republic politicians, and illustrations would convey the contrast with days when the Kaiser had ruled. The huge amount of publicity the press gave to murder trials and police investigations, for instance, created the impression of a society drowning in a sea of violence. Now, outside the cities, the non-political press, often fed by right-wing press agencies, had a similar but quieter effect. People who read this type of paper became convinced that the Republic was a failure, that someone had to rise up to take power, either the Kaiser or his son, or some messiah-type figure. So in the end, the press did have some effect in swaying the minds of voters and influencing them in a the general way against Weimar democracy. But the Boulevard Press was only one of many new and for some disquieting developments on the media and cultural scene in the days before Hitler came in. Experimental literature like the poetry of the Dadaist the modernist novels of Alfred Doppelin, the social critical plays of Berlacht, or sorry, Bertolt Brocht, the biting political journals of Kurt Tchaikovsky and Karl von Asayix, all divided readers between the minority who rose to the challenge of the new and the majority, majority who saw this as cultural Bolshevism. And the conservatives also had their own literature, rooted in nostalgia for the lost years of Bismarck, that prophesied that a Bismarck would soon return and crush the Weimar Republic. One of his writers was Oswald Spengler. He wrote The Fall of the West, which divided human history into the four seasons of the year, stated that Germany was currently in the winter phase, but spring was coming, my friends. Now, Spengler wrote that winter could be recognized by the rule of the inorganic cons cosmopolitan masses, and the collapse of established stage forms. Other writers as ill concluded Arthur Muller von der Brook, who said the Third Reich was coming, that was going to be better than the First Reich of Charlemagne, and much better than the Second Reich of Bismarck. He said this is a dream, but it was up to his readers to make it a reality. When the Third Reich appeared, it would sweep away political parties, place all of Germany into a national world revival, restore Germany to its medieval roots and days of glory, and it was coming soon. And there are other writers, perhaps not so famous. These writers included Ernest Jünger, who had served in Army Special Forces and propagated in his book Storm of Steel the famous stab in the back myth, and stated that only in the front lines had man been able to exercise true violence and see suffering and inflicting a pain that would make them real men. The Fry Corps also had novels that talked about how members hated revolution and expressed this in murder and mayhem as they showed their manhood and resentful search for revenge. These novels stated that what was needed was a strong leader, ruthless, uncompromising, hard, willing to strike at Germany's enemies wherever he found them. Do you see a theme going on here? I do. Now, all of this expressed a widespread sense of cultural crisis, and not just among the conservative elites. And also, 
of course, much of what we call modernist culture and the media had existed before the Great War. Avant-garde art had been around for years, as well as atonal and expressionist music and sexually explicit drama. All of this existed since the first decade of the 20th century. There had even been constant disputes under the Weimar, no, sorry, the Vilmine Reich about how far literature should be allowed to go, and the threat posed by allegedly unpatriotic and subversive or pornographic and immoral books, all of which had been banned by the police. And all of this had been held in check under Kaiser Wilhelm II, so when he left the scene, they exploded. The censorship that existed under his reign ended, and that encouraged the media to venture into areas not allowed to enter before. The theater became the vehicle of radical experimentation, left-wing ideals. Cheap reproduction printing techniques made it easier to publish inexpensive illustrated papers and magazines for the public, and the establishment of the Bauhaus allowed for not only radical artists, but the teaching of the next generation as well. The Bauhaus was unpopular with the town of Weimar, who saw its bohemian students, the male and female, as un-German, and its radically simple, clean, and ultra-modern building, condemned by local politicians as owing more to the art form of primitive races than anything truly German. Now, starting in 1924, state funding was pulled, and the Bauhaus moved to Diesel. But it continued to create controversy, especially under his new director, Hannes Meyer, who came out of the political closet as a communist in 1930, and therefore was replaced by the architect Mies van der Rohe, who expelled all communist students and replaced the Bauhaus ethos with the more structured authoritarian regime. But yet in November 1931, this was not seen as enough. The Nazi majority town council closed it down. The Bauhaus moved a third time to a factory in Berlin, but it was just a shadow of its former self. There's also new means of communication adding to the threat of culture values under attack. Radio first began to make a mark as a popular communication during this period. A million listeners registered in 1926, three million in 1932. The airways opened to a wide variety of opinions. Cinema also began to become popular, though it had been around since the Great War in the larger cities, but now films began to attract mass audiences, and the coming of the talkies increased this still further by the end of the decade. Movies showed the distort disorientation of the Weimar Republic, the odd-angled sets of the cabinet of Dr. Kalagi, the erotically charged movie Pandora's Box, the satire of the Blue Angel, which ran into trouble for portraying a sensual female, cynical, manipulative, and erotic, or the pacifist movie about the Great War all quiet on the Western Front. And music theater had also been transformed. Before the war, theatergoers could listen to Wagner and other types, and they lose themselves in the story, but now the theater was slow showing political ideals of the day. Dressed up in stories set in the 19th century, with poor and downtrodden characters who spoke like everyday people. Many conservatives blamed this on the Jewish influence, as well as the cultural Bolshevism, and demanded the government protect the German musical tradition. An even greater threat was posed by the American influence of jazz, which found its way into works like Three Penny Opera, a musical about thieves and criminals, or Johnny Strikes Up, which featured a black magician as its main character. Yet many modernist composers defended jazz as a way to renew the art, and stated that it was popular in the masses in the nightclubs and bars in Berlin, and that visiting big band and chorus lines brought culture and the outside world into Germany, and allowed the German situation to be shown in a brighter light with the idea that someone, someday, would take notice. Perhaps this would lead to lifting the restriction to Versailles. But many saw the cabaret shows as simply a way to hide in plain sight the ideas of pornography and drugs and satire and modern dance. Music critics denounced jazz as a treason against proper German music and what was called primitive music, brought about by, well, let's say to use racist terms that begin with N that I will not use here, but imagine, and you're going to get the drift. Jazz and swing was said to be bringing Americanism to Germany and ruining Germany with the films of Charlie Chaplin or the modern industrial methods of Fordism and Taylorism. Mass production held out the prospect of a mass consumption with great department stores, 
offering an astonishing variety of international goods and foreign operated stores like Woolworths, putting some of these goods within reach of the average working class family. Mass housing schemes and designs for modern living, however, challenged the German conservative ideals and signified the pressing need to bring back German living, German traditions, and German ties of blood and soil. The older Germans in particular felt alienated by the new atmosphere of culture and sexual freedom that followed the end of official censorship and police controls in 1918, and that was emphasized for many by the nightclubs of Berlin. The feeling among many was that order and discipline had been swept away in the revolution in 1918-1919, that moral and sexual values that were just awful took over society. Social Democrats and Communists, who would, you would think would be for all this, were among the most vocal opponents. Many of them were shocked at the openly hedonistic culture of the young in Berlin after the war. The commercialization of leisure in the cinema, the tabloid press, the dance hall on the radio was alienating many young people from the sterner, more traditional values of the labor movement culture before the war. Now, the sexual freedom that the young people were enjoying in the big cities was a particular source of disapproval in the older generation. And here we can see that there have been harbingers before the war. The rise of a large vocal feminist movement had, accom had accustomed the public and the press of women speaking out on all kinds of issues, occupying at least some portion of responsibility and making their way into the world. After 1910, May 8th became Germans a day when women would march for the vote, which they did succeed eventually in gaining. And once that had been gained, a strong minority of fem feminists started to push for sexual fulfillment, equal rights to unmarried women, and the provision of free contraceptive advice. Berlin, as well, had become, by the time the Great War started, a center of the three thriving gay and lesbian scene in Germany. It only continued after the war. Now, critics pointed out that these trends traced back to the decline of the family caused mostly by the growing economic independence of women. The rapid emergence of a service sector in the economy which gave women new jobs possibilities in sales in the great department stores, secretarial work in the booming office world, and other types of jobs created new forms of exploitation, but also gave increasingly number of young unmarried women a financial and social independence they had never had before. As in 1918, there were 11 and a half million women working, which made up 36 percent of the working population. And many of them worked as tram conductors and in department stores, and even in legal, university, and medical professions. An increased female competition to male workers and in general fear among nationalists that Germany would become weaker if the birth rate declined more than it had since 1900, merged with wider cultural anxiety to produce a backlash that was already seen by 1914. Now, before the war, nationalists and pan-Germans started to push for women to go back home, take care of the family, bring more children into the world. All this forced the feminists to go on the defensive, and that marginalized their radical supporters who stressed that they were truly nationalists. They didn't want to go too far in the demands, these majority feminists. And starting in 1918, women were given the right to vote and stand for election from local councils to the Reichstag, and they were given the right to enter the major professions, and they became more prominent than before the war. Now this led to hostility of male supremacists who believed that women needed to be back at home, and now people listened. Their disapproval was reinforced by the far more open display of sexuality than before the war, seen in the big cities. Even more shocking to many was the public demand for gay rights by individuals and groups that stated that homosexuals were a third sex, and who demanded the ab abolition of paragraph 175 of the Reich Criminal Code, which outlawed indecent activity between adult males. And conservatives became even more angry at the fact that the Scientific Humanitarian Committee was, in 1919, turned into the state-funded Institute for Sexual Science in Berlin, which offered sex counseling, 
held popular question and answer sessions on sexual topics, and pushed for reform of all laws regulating sexual behavior. Now it must be stated that nationalist hostility was driven by more than just crude moral conservatism. Germany lost two million men in the war, and the birth rate was still in a rapid decline. Between 1900 and 1925, live births per thousand from married women under the age of 45 fell from 280,000 to 146,000. Laws restricting the sale of condoms were eased in 1927, and by 1931, there were more than 1,600 vending machines in public places that sold condoms. Sex counseling centers were opened that offered contraceptive advice, and many were funded by state governments. Abortion, although being far more controversial because of the medical risks, also had the law relaxed, and the penalty reduced from a felony to a misdemeanor. Now, many took all this in and saw it as a plot to destroy the German race from within, and that included women and men, regardless of party, regardless of social background. So that's the older people. What are the younger people doing? Well, the younger people, especially the teenage boys, were already forming their own distinctive cultural style in the years leading up to the Great War. An important role in this was a growing youth movement, a series of informal clubs which focused on hiking and communion in nature and singing folk songs by sitting around campfires. Of course, starting in 1919, all the political parties began to focus on recruiting the young. They formed their own youth groups, but what was striking about the youth movement in general was its independence from formal political move institutions combined with the contempt for the moral compromises and dishonesty of the adults. Now, this movement also fostered a distrust of modern culture and city life in formal political parties. Members of the organizations would wear uniforms like the Boy Scouts did. And they were taught anti-Semitism, refusing to admit Jews in the ranks, rejecting smoking, rejecting drinking, rejecting sex with girls, even to the point of not allowing girls into the organization either. The youth movement with its influence strongest among the Protestant middle class, was scarcely countered by the impact of the educational system on young Germans. When Wilhelm II ruled, the Kaiser's influence was exercised in favor of displacing liberal traditions of German education based on classical mod models with patriarch lessons that focused on German history and German language. By 1914, many teachers were nationalist, conservative, monarchist, Textbooks and lessons were the same, but there was a very, very small minority that held a variety of opinions on the liberal center and left. After the Great War, states dominated by the Social Democratic Democrats, especially Prussia, made strenuous efforts to persuade the schools to educate their students to be model, model citizens loyal, loyal to the Weimar Republic. And as a result, millions of young people came out of school as convinced communists or social democrats or as members of the Senate party if they're Roman Catholic. Other students ignored everything they were taught in school. They clung to ideas of the parents, and they joined the politics of the radical right. In the end, none of the lessons and none of the teachers can compete with what the young saw every day on the Divine Republic, which meant that by the late 1920s, many were either members of the Nazi party or the Communist Party willing to break the system from within. Now, for those lucky enough to go into university, many came out from the university as committed members of the right because there was dueling course in the university, and majority of the teachers were conservative, monarchist, and nationalist. Now, there were a few liberal teachers, but many of the universities were made up of elite members of society, glad to teach middle-class students in schools that dated back to the time of Luther, if not before. Now, some of the students who were in the universities in the year after the Great War were involved in putting down the revolution, but by 1920, the university started to shift left. The students established a general student unions, which all students had to belong to. And these student unions were involved in student welfare and university reform. But these groups soon fell under the influence of the far right, after the terms of the Treaty of Versailles became known, soon students who were right wing would join the general student unions, because they had to, and only to tear them down within. And it was made worse by the fact that the inflation made income worthless. 
Overcrowding made conditions in universities unbearable. In 1914, there were 600,000 students in universities. 1931, there were 104,000. And when the government poured money into the university, it soon became popular to go, not only for the middle class students, but for sons of the lower civil servants, small businessmen, manual laborers. Many of them had to work their way for the university. And that created further resentment. By 1924, in fact, there were so many students that the chance of finding a job upon graduation was poor. By 1930, non-existent. Now the professors, as I said, they're mostly right-wing. And they continued. They had lectures denouncing the Treaty of Versailles and the French occupation of the war and the Jewish students that are coming from the East to enroll in the university. Now many feared the Jews would take over the vacant university chairs and so they quit hiring. Whole departments were pretty much emptied. No teachers. No schools. No education. By 1928, the university was, for the most part, a haven for the far right. A generation of graduates was entering the world thinking of themselves as elite. And they were anti-Semitic, and they were racist, and they were German nationalists. And these young men saw violence as the only way to fight the disaster that overtaken Germany, and this generation would play a leading role in the Third Reich. Now today, I've talked about how cultural change in years of Weimar. It's one more area I need to talk about. That's the area of crime. Weimar's radically modernist culture was obsessed by the deviance, murder, atrocity, and crime of the day. Graphic drawings were full of violent scenes of rape and murder. Murders were central figures, murderers were central figures in films and plays and novels. The trials of real serial killers like Fretz, Fritz Hartmann or Peter Curtin, the Dusseldorf vampire, were nationwide media sensations. Graphic reporting in the press catered to a mass readership that followed every twist and turn in these guys' trials. Corruption became a center theme in novels. The criminal became an object of fascination and rear fueling respectable anxiety, and were fueling respecting respectable anxieties about social order and adding to middle class's taste as an inversion of values that seemed to be at center of modernist culture. Now the huge publicity given to serial killers convinced many that the death penalty, penalty had to be enforced, and that censorship needed to be brought back. But the inflation disorder years after the Great War had seen the emergence of organized crime on a scale the revival Chicago in the 1920s. The feeling that crime is out of control is widely shared among those whose job was to keep the law and keep the order that many people thought was under a threat. The whole judicial system of the Vil Vilmine period was transported unchanged to the Weimar era. The civil and criminal law codes almost entirely unamended in attempts to liberalize them by abolishing the death penalty, penalty, ignored. Now, as before, the judiciary was a body of men trained to be judges from the beginning of education. So many judges had been members of the judiciary for years and still supported the values and attitudes of Kaiser Wilhelm II, or even Bismarck. The position under Weimar was made stronger since the new democracy made it clear that the judiciary was independent of political control, and the judges were all the more independent because the vast majority of them regarded laws passed by the Reichstag instead of Kaiser as laws of lies, and so many judges just simply ignored those laws. The extreme left and extreme right-wing parties had specific departments devoted to cynical business and making political capital out of trials. They kept the staff of lawyers to develop the battery of sophisticated and ugly, unscrupulous techniques of turning court proceedings into political sensations. Many blamed the system of Weimar for this development, but the judges themselves could be regarded as ex exploiting trials for their own political purposes. After years of treating social democrats and left local critics as criminals and traitors to the Kaiser, they're not about to readjust their attitudes. Their loyalty was never to the Weimar Republic, it was always to some abstract idea of the Reich, idea built largely in memories of what Bismarck had done. In 1925, left-wing statistician Emil Julius Gumbel published figures 
which showed that the 22 political murders committed by left-wing offenders from 1919 to 1922 led to 38 convictions, which included 10, 10 executions and prison sentences averaging 15 years each. By contrast, the 354 political murders committed by the right in the same period led to 24 convictions, no executions, and prison sentences averaging four months each. In fact, 23 right-wing offenders who confessed were left off, let, left, let off by the court. Of course, these figures are probably not accurate. And there are frequent pardons of political parties by the Reichstags of many political offenders who only served maybe months before being released. But what matters was the judge's behavior that sent a message to the public combined with numerous prosecutions of pacifists and communists and other left-wing offenders. Now today we've talked about all the various changes in culture in Germany from the press, in art, in education, and in the law. But these are only the various means of getting across ideas. So next time I will look at where these ideas went, and then, I promise, we'll be getting to the point of this podcast when you introduce the Nazis. So stay tuned.